I was asked to um, talk about settlement dynamics, and I'm going to talk about settlement dynamics, but I also want to talk a little bit about the methods that we use to get some of these data. It's kind of following along with the presentation that Tom just gave. And Tom and I kind of colluded a little bit before this to make sure there wasn't too much overlap. So what Tom showed you was some of the high-tech 21st century methods. I'm going to do this for the 19th century version here. I'm going to do um, sort of uh, what, what's called pedestrian survey. Uh, so let's see the pointer in this. Here we go. So a pedestrian survey is just one way of surveying. Um, it's a way of finding natural things and ancient human-made things by walking across the landscape. And these are things that are going to be found on the surface of the land that you don't actually have to excavate. Um, there is a broad range of things to be found. I like to think of them as being on a spectrum between the largest things and the smallest things. So if you can imagine large things would be massive temples and, and palaces, getting to the smaller end of the spectrum, we see um, smaller artifacts. And so this is sort of where a pedestrian survey has one of its strengths because it, it does a really good job finding these smaller things. One of the things that um, Tom mentioned is that you, you sometimes have difficulty finding small house mounds with uh, remote sensing technologies. Um, now, pedestrians, as, as um, so, so, so one of the advantages here is that it gives you a more kind of holistic, sort of well-rounded view of the landscape as a whole so that you can talk about the lives of <coughs> more humble Maya in addition to those of the nobles that live in the bigger architecture. Now, nobody really does pure survey or only survey because to really understand the patterns that you see on top of the landscape, you have to do some excavation. So it's important to remember that, that survey is really just the first step of a multiple sort of stage archaeology project that eventually has excavation and many other exciting forms of analysis. So um, it, it's pretty fitting for me to be giving this presentation here at Penn because some of the people who really developed um, some of the pedestrian survey methods were part of the uh, University of Pennsylvania Museum project, specifically the, the, the T. Call project. So um, in this particular presentation, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the methods of doing pedestrian survey. Uh, that's going to involve talking a bit about the, the, the history of systematic pedestrian survey, also talk about specifically how we do it on the ground. Then I'm going to move to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of this kind of survey. And then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about whether some new technologies will make this kind of survey obsolete. And then in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk about some specific results of, excuse me, specific results of pedestrian survey and some projects that I myself have done, specifically working in the, the northern lowlands of, of Yucatan at the site of Chuchukmil, um, Uki, and a little bit down here at, at Yashuna. Chuchukmil is kind of an interesting site for pedestrian survey because we found that it was, it was so much bigger than we thought it was and it has some really intricate settlement details. So we have, get, a, get a nice idea of, of movement through the site from looking at the survey data. Um, at Uki, we're going to be talking about how the rise and fall of the local center of Uki sort of impacted settlement dynamics um, uh, nearby it. OK, so I'm going to go right into um, how do you do a pedestrian survey. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have seen this movie from the 1980s called Spaceballs. <laughs> spoof of uh, Star Wars. In the first Star Wars movie, you know, Darth Vader wanted to find those two droids that were uh, shipwrecked on that, that dusty desert planet, and that's also where Luke Skywalker, Skywalker was from. So in Spaceballs, there's this kind of parallel scene where they're trying to find something in the desert. I don't remember what they're trying to find, but they say, comb the desert. And this is essentially what you do <laughs> on a pedestrian survey, except instead of each <coughs> person in a place at each time of the comb. So you have four or five or eight people kind of walking in single file, kind of combing the landscape. I'm going to talk about some more details of that in a second. But uh, there were sort of two important origins of this kind of survey. One, um, I'm going to talk about the, the Tikal project. The other was in central Mexico, in the highlands. And uh, William Sanders, he um, began surveying the basin of Mexico, specifically in the uh, Teotihuacan Valley. Basin of Mexico, by the way, is where modern-day Mexico City is. It's where the ancient Aztec capital was. He began in 1960 surveying the Teotihuacan Valley. And by 1975, he and his colleagues had 
3,500 square kilometers completely combed. So this is a huge achievement that was duplicated in other places, such as the Valley of Oaxaca, where in the 1970s and 80s they surveyed a little over 2,000 square kilometers. And so the method is still in use in the, in the, the central Mexican highlands. Now in the Maya lowlands, there are some difficulties in adapting this method. And one is because in the highlands, the distance they put between each surveyor on that comb was about 50 meters. So this is an illustration from Sanders' own book, and it kind of shows you, it gives you a sense of how, how much space is between one person and the next. With that distance, even with dry conditions where visibility is good, you can still miss stuff, because in this, in this case, you would be responsible for 25 meters to your left and 25 meters to your right, or your right and your left. <laughs> but you're seeing it from this side, so it doesn't matter that I messed up my right and left. Um, you, can, you, you can still miss some things. Uh, now, the problem with um, the Maya lowlands is that most of the terrain is quite heavily vegetated. So if you try to space yourself that far apart, you're not even going to be able to see the person to your left or to your right. Sometimes not hear them. You can easily get lost. Plus, you don't often have the, the benefit of, of landmarks on a nice aerial photo or satellite image. This is an area that I'm going to be surveying this summer. And there's almost nothing to help you find yourself. I, I've, I've been on surveys where people get lost just trying to keep a 20 meter space. So, so it's kind of difficult. Um, how do, you actually, how do you actually do this? The idea is you, you basically can't do huge areas, so instead you do pieces. So Karin Hazard made a brilliant map that he called, published in 1961, part of the Penn Museum project, revolutionized, excuse me, revolutionized our idea of Maya centers. It shifted us from this ceremonial center idea to the notion that a site like Tikal was an actual urban center, a metropolis. Um, Dennis Pulison kind of picked up after that, and what he did was these settlement transects. So to the east, west, and south, he did 10 kilometer long transects that were 500 meters wide. And then to the north, he did about 18 kilometers going up to wash up to him. So Pulison's sort of transect method, uh, 1965, 1966, kind of set the standard for, for trying to survey in the jungle in the scrub forest. And they're called fishbone transects because when you look at them, they, they look like the skeleton of, of a fish. Let me kind of show you how this works. So imagine here's Tikal and Washaktun. Let's see, say this is the area you want to survey in the middle of it. You begin by cutting a center line with your machete. You just cut a, cut a path between the two, or a breccia, between the two um, sites. And then maybe every 100 meters or so, you cut what's called, what are called ribs. And what you end up is with the, what you end up with is sort of the skeleton of a fish. Now to actually do the survey, you set up your, your four or five people, and with a compass, they have just walked the 100 meters to the next rib. Um, one problem, though, notice my walk, whoops, my walker has kind of got out of line. That's because if, you're, if you have to navigate around clumps of trees like this, you sometimes kind of lose, lose your, 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 your orientation. So that's why it's good to have these ribs every 100 meters or so, so that the error, you know, if you get, get, get out, you're walking in the wrong spot, the error doesn't compound itself. Now these days, so, so this is how you do it. You kind of, you, you send your team, they go back up the other way, they finish that side, you move them to do the rest, and then you eventually fill in all this area. These days, with handheld GPSs, you can make this a lot quicker. You don't have to cut so many trails through the forest. In fact, you can just cut two trails on each side and then set your, walk, your, your, your comb on one side of the transect and sort of survey the whole 500 meters across. Because the GPS tells you exactly where to walk. In fact, the GPS will tell you where the boundaries of your survey area are. So you actually don't have to cut, let's say going across, finish, let's finish this little survey here, you don't have to cut the side lines. Um, I like to cut at least one path through there so that you have at least one clear area where you're not sort of struggling to, to walk around. Um, okay, so that's sort of, that, that's one of many ways that you can on the ground implement one of these sort of transect type fishbone surveys. Uh, so some of the advantages of this kind of survey is that it's systematic, which is to say once you define your survey block, whether it's a long transect or something a bit wider, you find just about everything there. You've got a pair of human eyes 
on almost every square meter of that area. And so that leads to this other advantage. It finds things across this size spectrum. You can get um, some of the smallest things you can find. Now, a disadvantage is it takes a long time. Um, if, you're, if your goal is just to find the big sites, the big architecture, pedestrian survey, and let's say, and let's say your, your, your survey area is rather large, let's say you want to do a whole uh, 10 mile by 10 mile block, you don't want to do a pedestrian survey. Uh, some of the techniques that Tom was talking about, good old fashioned um, looking at aerial photos, the large bounds will cast a shadow. This is from the site of Chucho Hill. Aerial photos, uh, talking with local folks, if there are any, they can take you usually to where the big mounds are. And it'd be a waste of time to spend years walking over this landscape just to find the big stuff. Um, but then again, if you want to find that small stuff, you kind of have to do the walking. So this gets us into the question of, uh, is there a new technology that could also, maybe a remote sensing technology, that could find the small stuff? And the answer is yes. Um, I'm just going to skip these two slides very quickly. So the, the, uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of um, Diane and Arlen, who are going to speak later today about LIDAR. But the advantage of LIDAR is that it sees through the vegetation, and it can find, it can find really small stuff. Um, the way it works, basically, is that it creates a, a three-dimensional digital elevation model, which is basically just a relief map, an elevation map. And because Maya houses are often built on top of elevated platforms, you, you, you can find those, those changes in the elevation, which are the footprint of platforms. Um, so when I first read about this, I was like, well, this, this could really be great, and I think it is great. But I was initially a bit skeptical, because I read that there was a, an error of about 50 centimeters on the vertical. And I thought, well, where I work, um, we have most of the buildings that I find are below 50 centimeters. I thought, well, that might be a problem. For example, this is just a landscape near the key that I went out and mapped with the total station. So we have very good accuracy uh, in terms of elevation. Each color change is about 20 centimeters. And just looking at this digital elevation model, which is somewhat similar to the, to the, the, the data you get from LIDAR, you would actually have difficulties predicting where the actual mounds are. This is where they happen to be. So they're not, they don't always, it's not sometimes hard to see them topographically. But then, just a few months ago, I saw this 2009 <coughs> paper that showed that LIDAR can do actually much, much better than 50 centimeters. These guys were trying to locate what was in 1755, a two meter deep trench somewhere up in Canada. It was, it was built as a kind of a defensive feature that today has been filled in almost to, so it's almost, so it's hard to see. These folks found some of it on foot and then um, did a LIDAR survey of that. And the LIDAR survey picked up parts of this trench that you couldn't even see with the human eye. So I'm a big convert to LIDAR and hope to kind of switch over. But there is still always, as Tom said, there's always going to be a need for ground truthing. A couple of things we still need to do. Well, for example, in, in the central Mexico, some of the smallest sites, the only, the only remains that you see on the surface are scatters of potsherds. And that's going to be very hard to see with any remote sensing technology. Um, closer to home in, in where I work, some of these mounds are just kind of, um, they're, they're just kind of amorphous blobs that if you looked at them on a topographic map would show up a lot like any old small rise in the natural land surface. So it'd be hard to distinguish a, a, a human built small mound from just a natural rise. And so in that case, a pair of eyeballs is, is the way to go. And so you have to get out there and take a look at the landscape. All right. So, um, I'm going to move now to some of the, the results of some of the surveys I've done, uh, looking at some of the dynamics. I'm going to begin with Chuchuk Mill. Um, this was part of the Pathway Regional Economy Program at Chuchuk Mill. I was, uh, that's where I did my dissertation. The um, project was founded and directed by uh, Bruce Dolan. Bruce passed away about two months ago. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, well, I practiced this. Anyway. Yeah, I wouldn't be here if, if it weren't for Bruce. Okay, one of the one of the interesting things about Chuchuk Meal is it lacks it lacks a large it lacks a monumental center. 
doesn't, unlike Chichen Itza, where I belong, other sort of northern lowland sites that have you know, big pyramids and sort of monumental plaza, you have to, have, this is a map of the, the very center of Chuchuk Mill, you actually have to project, I actually have to kind of color in the large things to actually find so that you can actually see what the big architecture is. It does have a lot of causeways that connect to other, um, that connect these large, these monumental groups together, but they're, they're kind of hard to see. And now another interesting thing about Chuchuk Mio, and this is borrowing a map from uh, Bob Scherer and, and Loa Traxler, is that it's located in, in the, the, the part of the Maya region that has the least amount of rainfall. And the, the site was first documented in the 1970s by the Archaeological Atlas of Yucatan, and there were rumors that this was a pretty big site. So we thought, wow, how, you know, how can a site that seems to be big support itself in an area of very little rainfall? And furthermore, where Chuchuquil is located, there's very little soil. About a third of the land surface is bedrock. So this set up a number of research questions. Just how big was Chuchuquil? How did it support itself? Um, how did it get along politically with other large centers in the region that were better known and that had hieroglyphic inscriptions, such as Oshin Tok? And some of these questions we were able to answer with the pedestrian survey. So in 1996, we began mapping the site. We wanted to go for a 16 square kilometer block. This would make it equivalent to the amount of the, 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 uh, the amount of Tikal, which was mapped by Carl uh, Hazard in the late 50s. So we began in 1996 with a small piece. 1997 did some more. 98 a little bit more. This is what we did in 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. In 2003 was a lab season, and we thought, wow, we've spent seven seasons and we haven't even finished half of what we set out to do. Why, why, why are we going so slow? Because the features we were mapping were so intricate. So anyway, in 2003, we decided, let's just go, let's just do a little bit more in, in 2004 and 2005. And what we ended up with, what we ended up with was a 9.4 square kilometer block. Um, we're able to kind of classify the site into different zones. There's the site center, which has the, the kind of large architecture. So the of this architecture is actually as big as the architecture at, say, San Bartolo. So I, I thought it was kind of interesting last night. Simon Martin mentioned it as a, a, a very insignificant site. So I guess you have to keep things in perspective. Um, <laughs> beyond the site center, we found uh, a zone which we call the residential core. Here, the density of structures is 950 per square kilometer. Let's move this to the side so we can actually illuminate part of that dense settlement. Hmm. The density of structures here is, is really quite astounding. This is the, the, the most densely populated site in the classic period um, in, in the Maya area. And figuring out, you know, sometimes with all these little things bumping into each other, figuring out what they actually look like required walking around them a number of different times. So, that, so this is a, a spot where just using remote sensing might not help you out as much. Just to compare a, a high density area of Tikal with an average density area of Chunchuk Mil, or an average density area in Tikal with an average density spot in Chunchuk Mil gives you a sense of the density of occupation. Now, another interesting feature that, that um, would, would have been hard to get without actually walking across the landscape were these yellow lines. These yellow lines are sort of walls, they're like fences that surround house lots. Uh, let me kind of zoom in. This, you can see this more clearly. So this is a lot like contemporary villages in Yucatan that have stone walls around their, um, around their mountains. Except these stone walls, you know, they've all collapsed and they're, they're, they're kind of sometimes hard to see on the surface. And so again, it's one of these issues that you, you really need to walk across the landscape to find them. Uh, they even make, make these alleyways in some parts. You can see, I've highlighted in red, the spots where the <coughs> walls run in parallel. And so we kind of reconstructed one of these alleyways. So, so this makes this was a really a good map for us because we could see the, these sorts of field boundaries. Well, not field boundaries. Uh, house lot boundaries are very rare in the, in the classic period. And so, by reconstructing them through this survey, we could get a sense of whose land pertained to what to, to, to whose household. We could get a sense of sort of where people were walking through the landscape by tracing out these pathways. So this was some, some great data that, 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 um, that we had to get by walking over every sort of single, single spot. All right, beyond the, the residential core, we had a, what we call the residential periphery, about 350 structures per, per, per square kilometer. 
By now, we actually can find some open spaces in between these house lots. They're still using these walls, though, uh, interestingly. Um, one thing you'll notice from our map, map, you know, we didn't actually find the edges of the site after this 9.4 square kilometer block. So we did some of these fishbone transects, uh, southeast, southwest, northwest, northeast, and one going off to the east, sort of hopefully in the direction of uh, Oshkin Tok. We obviously didn't, didn't get very far. Um, and to, to figure out the edges of the, this blue area, the, the residential core, we can look at these two transects. And so we'll look at this northeast transect. There's about 700 meters of, of, of residential core beyond that 9.4 square kilometer block that we mapped. Um, looking at uh, to the east, there's only about, if, if that, 100 meters. So with that, with those two data points, we could kind of estimate where the edges of the residential core was, and that gave us an estimate of about seven square kilometers for this residential core. To estimate the residential periphery, it was a little bit easier. We found just on the, the central map that we, you kind of hit the edge of it uh, on our map, and, and we uh, did a, these two um, transects here confirm that. The modern town of Chushuk Mill is right there, so the surveying there is not as useful. Looking over at the east side of the site, we find that uh, resident, the, the periphery about a thousand meters beyond the edge of the residential core. Looking at the southeast, we found about 800 meters of it beyond the area that we've mapped before. And looking to the east, it's actually kind of equivocal because the settlement density here is about 120 structure per square kilometer. That's above our sort of hinterland settlement density, sort of the, 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 just the density you find beyond the large archaeological sites, but well below a residential periphery. The reason why it's kind of in between is that there's another, oopsie, another site right there, and that's kind of throwing off this, this, uh, this um, density distribution. Anyway, so we could, putting that data together, we can kind of estimate that the residential periphery covered about eight and a half square kilometers. Combined, the periphery and the core and the center are about 17 square kilometers. There's a little bit more to the site in these kind of what we call fingers that move out to some of these other sites nearby. We have only found two of them. But if you do some estimates, again, these are kind of, um, these are uh, preliminaries, sort of like Tom Garrison's estimate, we would say, using the same methods of estimation used at other Maya sites, that this, this city had 40,000 people. So, um, so this was pretty exciting to find. It meant that uh, looking at the, you know, some of our paleo environmental folks um, showed that um, this was probably too much to be fed by this agricultural area. Plus, there's all kinds of smaller sites in the vicinity of Chuchuk Mill that had to be fed as well, not to mention large sites like Oshkin Tok that um, kind of hover over the better farmland further east and other large sites like Siho to the south. Both of these sites have lintels <coughs> that are that have fifth and sixth century dates. We're talking kind of a late early classic settlement here. Um, in terms of sort of, sort of in terms of politics, although Oshkin Tok is the site that has more carvings, we found that Chuchuk Mill dwarfs Oshkin Tok in terms of its demography. So, so really the only rival in the northern lowlands during the early classic, the only rival to Chunchuk Mil in terms of size would be Izamal. So we have this kind of reconfiguring our notion of um, the power structure of the northern Martin Peninsula. All right, the final example I'm going to talk about is actually is kind of a, a mix of, of two little surveys. One that I did off the east edge of Yashuna, another um, that's ongoing uh, between Uki and Kansakab. Both of these surveys uh, focus on sock bays, these long-distance intersite raised causeways. Uh, there are six of that, six long-distance systems that we know of so far in the Maya area. Four of them are pictured here. Um, you can see these intersite causeways pretty easily on a um, on an over on, on, on aerial photographs. This is the one between Wuki and Kansakab. They don't tower over the landscape. They're not, but they are sort of monumental in terms of how many people would have been needed to build them. For example, um, this is just a total station map of, of a 400 meter segment of the, the causeway between Uki and Kansakab. And you see that this thing can get up to 1.1 meters high. It's anywhere from five to 10 meters wide. And this is one of the smaller causeways. So, so this would have required hundreds, if not thousands of people to construct. Um, the, in, in terms of what these things were for, we're not entirely sure yet. In the 1970s, Will Andrews and Ed Kerjack 
proposed that these were boundary markers, uh, that Uki, which would have been the center of a polity that included Kansakab, built this causeway to the edge of to Kansakab at the edge of its polity in the face of Zilam, which was another kind of large megalithic center in the early classic, and so there might have been a competition between Uki and Zilam. But we really don't know, and one of the reasons we don't know much about this is because there hasn't been much survey of, or, or research in general, of the sites along the causeway. There's been some research at the sites at the end of it, but to really understand sort of economic changes, social processes, I thought it would be interesting to see, you know, what do we find in addition to the stuff on the end. So I started this project in 2008, the Uki, UKRIF, the Uki Kansakab Regional Integration Project. And um, I don't want to, we, you know, we began by mapping the site center of Uki. We did these same fishbone transects to establish the boundaries. I'm just going to show one of them to, to, so, so you can uh, not <coughs> more fishbone transects. Uh, the, 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 the survey did a pretty good job of delimiting the, the western side of Uki. We found that the site is anywhere between four, sorry, anywhere between about seven and a half and 11 square kilometers. Uh, examination of aerial photos in the 1970s came up with an estimate of four square kilometers for Uki. So, so increasing the size of Uki, which is what we're able to do, makes, made a difference because four square kilometers, that's, there are other sites along the causeway that are, that, that are about that big. So now that we know that Uki is actually double that or more, we have an understanding of it actually being the political pool. Uh, last thing I'm going to show is this um, transect from Uki out to Kankab. This is about an eight kilometer long pedestrian survey, 500 meters wide. This is the, um, the distribution of settlements uh, along that eight, eight kilometer uh, long transect. And the, the, the density of structures here is a lot higher than, than much further away from the Sok Bay. And a little bit of research I did uh, near Yashuna on the causeway between Yashuna and Koba provides a good, um, a good uh, comparison. So Yashuna is a pretty well-known site thanks to Dave Friedel's research there. He found that up in the north Acropolis, there was the, the, the royal family was putatively assassinated at the end of the early classic. So this is um, kind of a, just a quick Google image. You can see Sok Bay 1 pretty clearly in the, the, the satellite photo from Google. This is the area that was mapped by Friedel's project. This is the area that my, my colleagues and I mapped in 2007 and 2008. So I'm going to focus just on this, this area beyond the edges of the Yashima site. This is kind of what it looks like. But each of these dots is a, um, it's a building. But this is misleading because the actual chronology of the stuff here in red is not contemporaneous with the Sok Bay itself. A lot of this stuff is probably 1,000 years earlier than the construction of the Sok Bay, or 800 years or so. Compared to what we find along the causeway at Uki, there's a lot more stuff along it, and this stuff is contemporaneous with the causeway. So it seems like the causeway was some kind of a magnet for settlement. It may, may have started out as a political symbol, because you don't need a causeway to walk from Uki to Katsaka. There's no bajos or swamps up here in the northern, this part of the northern lowlands. So you could just, you could might as well have a path. So, so if this began as a political symbol, it ended up being a lot more than that. People settled near it, and in fact, at the, at the, at the end of this causeway, um, sorry, at the end of our eight kilometer long transect, which uh, arrives at Kankab, uh, our survey showed that there, are, there is a building at the edge of the site that seems to almost be like a toll booth, almost like a kind of monitoring entrance to the site. And there are buildings like this um, on other sides of these the large sites as well. So um, in the end, oh, and, and, and furthermore, once the key's power sort of declined, we begin to see um, people moving away from the causeway. And in fact, at a site about three kilometers off the causeway, a ball court was built right after Uki sort of began to be abandoned. So it suggests that, that Uki did indeed have a kind of a, a, a rise and fall that had some impact on regional settlement patterns, had some impact on where people lived and also um, where they were able to, um, to, to hold ceremonies and, and uh, enjoy the ball game. Uh, so so and, and I, I guess by way of conclusion, just want to um, wrap up from, from what we learned from Chu Chu Meal. So, so the, this pedestrian survey is there, helped us pin down the size of the site, which kind of surprised us. It's not the biggest mine site, but it's quite big for its geographical area, given the low rainfall and bad soils. And that gives us sort of 
uh, we, it shows us that people couldn't just survive by farming, which kind of ties into some other lines of data we have for commerce and craft specialization. It gave, a, gave us kind of a, a new idea about that, that some Maya urban centers could have been very different, could have been commercial centers as opposed to the, the, the common um, Maya farming centers.